in this segment of the series, I will review with you the ultrasound evaluation of the hand and of the wrist. I will talk about the technique for obtaining your images, review some of the basic anatomy, and tell you the standard ultrasound scans for obtaining the images of the hand and of the wrist. And at the end of this series, I will give you some clinical correlations when looking at hand and wrist pathology. For scanning the patient's hand and wrist, I like to have the patient seated on the table, and I actually like to use a high-frequency transducer of at least 12 megahertz. In some cases, you may use um, a standoff pad, which will enhance the images, particularly around the bony structures of the knuckles. The patient is seated uh, with the elbow flex 90 degrees, and I like to have the patient rest their hand on a small pillow so that we can easily rotate from the palmar or the dorsal surface. The imaging structures should be again obtained longitudinal and transverse for all views and dynamic examinations helps out particularly with evaluating tendons uh, from nerves and actually looking for other areas of um, uh, pathology. Let's first look at the anatomy. Many of you will be familiar with this um, image of the hand of the wrist looking at the radius, the ulnar, and in the small bones, the carpal bones of the wrist, and then also the, the metacarpal and the phalanges. A close-up of this shows you to the left the radius and to the right the ulnar, and looking at the articulation between the radius with the scaphoid bone and the lunate, and over with the ulnar, you look at the triquetral bone. The pisiform bone is not shown in this view. Actually coming more distally, you can see the capitate and the hamate bones, uh, as they articulate with the metatarsal heads. The palmar view of the hand were mainly used to look at the thenar muscles and the hypothenar muscles, mainly looking for the flexor pollicis longus tendons, which might be a site of any um, tendinous pathology. And of course, we're looking at the uh, MCPs, the PIPs, and the DIP joints as well. The dorsal view of the hand will focus on the metacarpal phalangeal joints. We'll look over the um, dorsal aspect of the wrist and then also move distally to focus on the proximal interphalangeal and the distal interphalangeal joints. Let's first talk about the standard ultrasound scans of the wrist. There are seven standard scans that might be obtained. Um, sometimes you may do a limited ultrasound evaluation of the wrist where you don't have to obtain all the images, mainly focusing on, let's say, if you're looking at median nerve pathology. But the standard scans include a dorsal longitudinal scan, looking at the ulnar, then the radial aspect, and going in between that region, looking at the median aspect of the, um, of the wrist. Then we'll go transverse and mainly focus on the ulnar and the radial aspects. And then we'll look at the, um, the volar aspects, both longitudinal and transverse. The first standard scan is a dorsal uh, longitudinal scan, looking over the ulnar aspect of the um, wrist. Now let's move to the model so I can demonstrate you these on the ultrasound machine. So again, let me review with you the position of the patient. I like to have the patient seated in an examination table with the elbow flex 90 degrees and having the hand resting on a small pillow. That way I can easily access the dorsal or the palmar aspects of the hand. The first ultrasound image we would like to obtain would be looking at the medial aspect, okay, where we'll be over the ulnar bone as it articulates with the carpal bones and then we'll move more laterally. So the first image we will obtain, we're looking at to the left of the screen will be the ulnar bone. We will see the joint space with a small articular cartilage there. And then next you should become to the hypercord region of the triquetral bone. You actually will see here some of the extensor tendons that actually focus back and forth to um, bring out the fibrillar pattern of the tendons with this peritendinous sheath. The next image we obtain will be the dorsal median view. So we're just shifting in and looking at the next series of bones. If you look at on the anatomy drawing there, you'll see you'll pick up part of the um, distal head of the radius, and you should be getting part of this, um, the lunate bone. And these are the images that you will see. So starting from top, you see the skin with the hyperchoic signal and some subcutaneous tissue. The first bony landmark that we will see will be the radius, and then you will see the lunate, and then you get into the uh, other carpal bones. I will point out to you again, looking at the extensor tendons, as I move the transducer slightly back and forth, you see the fibrillar pattern 
of the extensor tendons of the wrist. In the next scan, we'll look at the dorsal uh, longitudinal scan. We'll be looking at the radial aspect, picking up the lateral most aspect border of the radial head as it articulates with the scaphoid bone. You can see that on the slide and actually just illustrated here on the ultrasound image. So now let's look at detail of the radial bone as it articulates with the scaphoid. So here on this image, we can see the hyperechoic signal of the radius, and then you see the scaphoid here. You are also able to see on her the articular cartilage. We put a little bit of pressure on the transducer and angle it back and forth to look at that region. The next image we would like to obtain will be the transverse images. And I will first focus on the ulnar, and then we move over and look at the radial aspect. So those similar structures that we saw, you'll begin to see those in cross sections. Uh, you can see a very nice picture of the, um, the extensor tendons of the wrist. And you begin to see the bones here. The first is gonna be, as illustrated on the anatomy slide, is gonna be the tip of the ulnars. And then as you move more laterally, you begin to pick up the other structures of the wrist. You might even see part of the lunate and actually just begin to get into the border of the radial head. If you scan over for the next image and move more laterally to you directly over the radius, and that's the structure that we're seeing here. So directly over the radial bone, as I focus back and forth on that, you're looking in transverse section, looking at the fibular pattern of the extensor tendons of the wrist. For the next image that we've obtained, we'll have the patient to turn their hand over. So we may look at the volar aspect of the wrist. The key important structure to this one, as we first obtain the longitudinal image, will just simply be to look at some of the tendinous patterns. Remember you have the palmaris longus, which is there mainly to stabilize the wrist. And you can see that fibular pattern just underneath the skin as we kind of focus back and forth slowly on that, this is gonna be the palmaris longus tendon. Other structures we'll see that, um, as we kind of go along, you can see also with the penetration of the ultrasound signal, you do pick up the bones, and in this region, you're looking at a junction between the ulnus and the radius. Let's next obtain the transverse image of the volar aspect of the wrist. This is a critical um, site to examine because this may be the site of a number of different clinical scenarios you will see in patients, whether they have carpal tunnel syndrome, osteoarthritis, or inflammatory type changes. Let me first demonstrate to you how to easily identify the uh, median nerve. Remember that the left side of the screen will be the medial aspect of the body, and the right side will be lateral. If you place the transducer this proximal to the crease of the wrist, and then go lateral until you pick up the signal from the radial artery, you can take advantage of the Doppler to show that you can see the nice pulsatile image coming from the radial artery. Going back to our standard B mode, if we move from the lateral aspect more immediately, we begin to see a number of different structures. The first pattern that we see, this kind of bright starry night type of pattern with the hyperechoic um, signal around it is gonna be the median nerve. How do we know it's the median nerve? Well, we can do a dynamic evaluation because the nerve should remain stationary as we identify uh, the tendons. So I'll first hold the patient's fingers down and have her to flex her thumb back and forth. And you'll begin to see, um, as she continues to flex her thumb back and forth, you begin to see that there is a, a, a structure that moves here. Um, that represents the flexor pollicis longus tendon. Note that this structure did not move. If I scan more immediately, and then hold the thumb stationary and ask her to flex her fingers back and forth, I see a series of tendons that begin to move, and again, this structure has remained stationary. So we know, for example, going from the radial artery and vein, that we will see the pattern from the median nerve. Next, we will see the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus, and then two rows of tendons that you can appreciate here, a more superficial layer and a deeper layer. These are the flexor digitorum um, tendons. One is the most superficial area, is the flexor digitorum superficialis. And that line deeper to that are the flexor digitorum profundus. So again, by performing this dynamic evaluation as she bends her thumb back and forth, 
you can see that there are structures that do not uh, move. Let's now review the standard ultrasound scans of the hands. In this view, the patient has the palm facing down, the hand is relaxed, and we actually first attain the dorsal longitudinal view, looking right over the metacarpal phalangeal joint. This is a very nice image to obtain because you can see um, several key important structures. Again, the um, skin, the subcutaneous tissue, and I will focus on and adjust my focal points and the intensity to get the um, nice hyperechoic signal of the bone. The metacarpal head was going to be on the left. The phalanges, phalanges is going to be on the right. The anechoic region right in this area is going to be the uh, articular cartilage. You do see a small amount of the um, tissue going abutting uh, into the joint space. Um, as you can tell, there's no fluid, there's no effusions and everything in that image. And that essentially comprises a dorsal longitudinal scan. Uh, we usually do two or three joints to kind of capture those standard images. The next one we'll obtain will be the dorsal transverse view. Remember that the ulnar is going to be the medial aspect of the joint, so we want to orient our transducer so that it remains the left part of the screen remains the medial aspect. Because you are going to be over the knuckles, there will be these areas of bony uh, protrudence. You want to use excess gel to compensate for any areas of anisotropy. So as you can identify here, the left side of the screen is going to be this third MCP. The right is going to be the second MCP. And in between that occasion, you can actually pick up the pulsation of some of the um, digital arteries. Those can be better seen on the palmar aspect, and I will demonstrate those for you as well. In this view, what you want to look at, you will see the extensor tendons here in cross section. See those fibrillar pattern, you're looking at those head on. You're looking at the cortical margins of the metacarpal um, joint. Here's a space in between. And then you're going more laterally right over the second metacarpal phalangeal joint. Again, make sure to slightly shift your transducer back and forth to compensate where there might be areas of anisotropy to make sure that's not a fusion or other changes, or is it simply coming from transducer, a transducer angle. Next we will obtain will be the Palmer images, which will be the final images looking at the hand. I'll obtain some more ultrasound gel. We first look at the longitudinal view, and just like we did on the dorsal surface, Focusing right over the metacarpal um, joints, I like to look at the second one. You may also look at the third. This is a very nice image to attain because not only do you see the, the joint space very well, but you actually can see the, the flexor tendons. Uh, and if we would slowly begin to uh, tilt the t uh, tip of the finger back and forth, you can see that the flexor tendon slides very nicely through a sheath. There's no areas of narrowing. There's no areas where there's catching. Those are some of the things you'll look for for people with pathology, for example, with trigger fingers and other types of changes. So this is a very, very nice image, and we can scan the whole length of that tendon as it goes from the palm distally into the proximal uh, uh, interphalangeal joints. So again, this is going to be the metacarpal head. This is going to be the phalanx. This is going to be the articular cartilage, and then the image of the flexor tendon as, we, as it courses along through its um, journey throughout the, the palm. The next image will be simply turn the transducer, keeping your medial aspect to the left of the screen to look at this image on cross-section. This is one of my favorite images because one, you can see not only nicely the bony margins and outlines very nicely, but you can actually appreciate, if you look at those flexor tendons, I make the analogy, it's like a straw going through a covering of a straw. Those tendons will be able to move, so you will see some space in between that. A patient who ha might have an effusion around those areas, that space will be thickened. So here you can see the bone and cross section, the tendons. We actually go in between the digits here. And in this case, you might be able to pick up some of the digital arteries uh, lighting up so we don't um, press too hard on the patients. You can identify the pulsating digital arteries as they run between the, the joints. These arteries come down from the palmar arch. You have a superficial and a deep palmar arch that actually um, give blood supply to the distal phalanxes. So again, the tendons and cross section, be sure to move your transducer slightly back and forth so you can identify all the patterns of the tendons as you're looking at more than one. We can focus on those and make sure there's no areas of changes. And that essentially gives you your transverse view of the palm. Next we'll look at the muscles over the thumb, the thenar muscle, and then we'll go over to look at the hypothenar muscles.
that when we're looking at the thenar region, the biggest thing we're going to focus on is not so much the muscle, but we really want to look at the tendon as it courses through the thumb. And that big tendon structure is going to be the flexor pollicis uh, longus. So first, when you put the transducer down, you will see that you have the structure here, and you just want to slightly tweak your transducer until you're able to catch the tendon as it courses its full length throughout the thumb. And again, a very nice dynamic view. If you had the patient slowly flex their thumb back and forth, you actually can see uh, that the tendon moves throughout there. There's no fluid around the sheath. There's no catching. Uh, and if we had her to hold the thumb steady, so if a patient had some tendonitis in that region, if we put on the Doppler looking for increase of signal in that, and of course she has none at all. So a very, very nice image to look at that. We look at the flexor pollicis longus, and then the big muscle from the um, thenar muscle, the flexor pollicis muscle that you see here. But the tendon is where we spend uh, most of our uh, time on. So that's the longitudinal view. And as we kind of go through that and get a transverse view, and all you're going to be looking at is those uh, fibrillar patterns of the tendons and cross-section. Again, remember to tweak your transducer back and forth to bring out all those tendons and cross-section and making sure there's no fluid accumulating around that. You will still see the body of the thenar muscle, flexor pollicis longus, and the rest of the muscle on that side. We do the same thing looking over the area of the hypothenar region. You can identify some of the tendons and muscles. This is not a huge area where this pathology Sometimes patients with rheumatoid arthritis with long-standing disease might have some changes in that area. But essentially what you're going to be looking at, um, not only superficially, but looking deeper for from some of the, um, the, the bones as well. You will begin to pick up part of the um, tendons going to that area and actually looking at the bony margins. So I'm just beginning to capture the beginnings of the uh, fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint. And I'm going to slide more proximally to pick up the region of the thenar region where you will begin to see some of the muscles and the tendons that go in that area. Again, scanning back and forth to make sure there's no changes, no abnormalities, and no areas of where there are decreased signal or hypoechoic areas that might represent fluid accumulation. Once you've attained the longitudinal view, you can do the same thing transversely. Nothing is fancy with the C. You're beginning to see deep here. We're picking up some of the carpal bones and part of the um, metacarpus that we see there and the other tendons that you'll see in cross sections. Occasionally on some patients, you might be able to pick up a part of the, um, the superficial arch uh, from the palmar arch. The next image you would like to obtain then will be to look at the uh, lateral um, aspects of the proximal phalangeal joints and the metacarpal phalangeal joints. This may be done with the patient from the palmar view or turning it over looking at the dorsal view. You essentially will be looking at the lateral aspects of those joints. Um, for most practical purposes, I like to obtain the second and the fifth because you can get around most, almost all of that joint. Similar to what we do when we look at the foot, you can look at the lateral aspect, the dorsal, and the palmar aspect. So once I've got the joint space identified, I'm scanning slowly back and forth, paying most attention to the bony margins of the joints, looking for um, irregularities, which might represent erosion. It might be a site of enthesitis or other types of changes that you can see here. So right in the middle of the screen, uh, left is going to be proximal, that's the, the metacarpus, right is going to be the phalanx, and just looking at the dis, um, distal port of that. Again, we usually recommend looking at the first, the second, and the fifth. Kira, I've looked at her um, second MCP, and we'll scan down and do the same thing of our second PIP. Because it is smaller joints, and sometimes you will slightly be over the edges where there are bony margins, you really want to make sure you compensate with excess gel or changing the angulation of the probe to compensate for any areas of anisotropy. And this image you can see for her right around the proximal phalanx, you can see a little area of, of hypochoric signal. That's going to rec represent part of the uh, articular cartilage. And then you're getting to, on the right side, the um, part of the distal phalanx that you begin to see. Again, looking for fluid accumulation or looking for other changes that you see. I'll get some excess gel to bring that out a little bit more. And as we really focus it on the bone. So again, with these images, you're able to go through the lateral surface, look at the palmar and the dorsal surface, and you almost covered almost the entire joint to looking uh, for areas of changes, which you're not able to do with ultrasound. And also, we showed you how you can do that in dynamic examination.
And lastly, we do the same thing. We're looking at the, and going from the lateral, to, uh, lateral aspect, we go to the medial aspect. So we gather some of this excess gel, then take advantage of that. We essentially want to do the same thing. This is gonna be uh, proximal, this is gonna be distal. And if we look right over the lateral aspect of the fifth metacarpal phalangeal joint, and if I scan more distally, the lateral aspect of the proximal and a phalangeal joint right in the middle of the, the image there. So scanning back and forth. What I would do on this one, we're gonna zoom in just a little bit to give us a little bit better detail. And I will actually shift the focal points to give us a maximal area of looking at the proximal uh, and the distal interphalangeal. So this is the proximal interphalangeal joint looking at that medial aspect. And again, this is really on the only areas that you need to capture uh, for your patients. So now that we've reviewed what you the standard scans to obtain for the hand and for the wrist, let me give you a few uh, clinical correlations. Like other parts of the body, the hand and the wrist could be a site where there could be active areas of inflammation. And in patients like that, you may identify not only effusions, but also swelling and changes around the tendons where they abut the, the synovium, giving patients teno, tenosynovitis. Um, one of the most common areas where I do my scans of the wrist is looking for median nerve pathology. You actually can capture and looking at the, um, the area of the median nerve for patients who might have disease. Ganglions can also be identified. The patients who might have neuromas, you can look at changes around those. More commonly though, you will see patients with rheumatoid disease who might have nodules that can occur anywhere there's motion of the wrist and some of those can occur over the areas of the flexor tendons and also over the flexor tendons of the wrist. Bony pathology like spurs for patients with osteoarthritis or erosions in people with erosive disease like rheumatoid arthritis can be easily identified. And then of course you can look for areas of deposition whether for calcification in patients who might have pseudogout or other types of crystal deposition like people with um, uric acid disease. I'll show you a few clinical uh, examples. This is a scan looking at the uh, wrist showing that again you do have a small effusion over the dorsal surface of the wrist looking in the region of the radial um, lunate um, bone. Next image you can see here showing you how if you look at the um, volar surface of the wrist and actually how you can measure the cross-sectional area of the median nerve. Most of the articles talk about people who have median nerve pathology that the median nerve will be greater than 10 millimeters square. So you can actually use that and combine it with other imaging studies or looking at um, EMG studies that can be done on the wrist. Of course, we talk about patients who might have erosive or disease or inflammatory disease, very nicely taking advantage of the Doppler. You can see increased signal in this area um, of the slide, and even more so in a patient here, in patients who might have gout or other types of inflammatory um, disease, taking advantage of the Doppler signal can show in those very nicely on, with the ultrasound. One of the nice things you can do, let's say if you have a patient who does have some thickening of the synovium, you want to put them on treatment and see if they're responding Using the ultrasound, you can very quickly take an image of the wrist. You can actually measure the thickness of the synovium as I illustrate here, and then bring that patient in for follow-up visit to see if that synovium has changed. In other words, if they have responded to therapy. So you can use the ultrasound to monitor the disease uh, um, response to therapy and actually change your treatment based on the images that you obtain. And finally, looking at, like we talked about, um, the tendons, looking at areas of effusions, you can see there, if there's thickening and elevation of the capsule surrounding the tendons, and looking for areas where there's hypoechoic signal that will represent fluid. This fluid will be compressible, and it will not usually enhance using the Doppler. Again, just like we do with the synovium, you can actually emerge these areas and actually use, do serial evaluations to kind of see if patients are responding to therapy. In addition to that, you can also use um, needle guidance uh, with the use of the ultrasound to deliver uh, depositions of corticosteroids or other medications. And here's an example again, looking at the elevation of the synovial tissue underneath the tendon, and that was measured and used to follow patients as they respond to therapy. So this concludes this series looking at the ultrasound evaluation of the hands and the wrist.